Camilla, thank you so much for organizing this. I'm really pleased and honored to be here. And um, hard acts to follow, uh, amazing papers so far. And um, I think I'm going to echo a lot of what Anshan and, um, uh, and uh, Margie have said. And I want to apologize in the advance, in advance because I have to quote Anshan here. I'm feeling that empirical reality exhibits a kind of psychedelic fluidity at the moment. Because <laughs> 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 I still haven't quite adjusted to the time change. So I apologize if I'm wandering. Um, so I wanted to start out with this vivid image of the fact that, of course, cancer is a multi-scalar phenomenon. There are many, many causes of cancer operating at a variety of different temporal and spatial scales. And also, of course, it's the case that cancer is enormously um, heterogeneous. It's not one kind of thing. It's perhaps hundreds or thousands, depending on how you count. In fact, I think that there are lots of different meaningful and true ways to count cancer kinds. But I wanted to make the, um, the, the massive heterogeneity and the causal complexity of cancer especially vivid by appealing to this image, not only because it appeared on the cover of Cancer Cell, which is kind of you know, hot stuff, and it's a, it's a great image, but also because I think it makes this point quite, quite clearly. So this is a circo plot. A circo plot is a representation of massive amounts of data, in this case data about genes and microRNA associated with a specific stage in a specific subset of a subset of a cancer. So in this case, it's microRNAs are the molecules that play a role in the regulation of gene expression. And this is from uh, 459 samples of ovarian cancer. Um, and what they're looking at is the association of particular types of uh, microRNA with particular types of genes associated with a particular stage of ovarian, of serous ovarian cancer namely a transition from the epithelial state when the cells are bound up together and tightly intertwined. So cells of the epithelium, our skin, our gut, um, ordinarily are in these nice tight little connections. But what has to happen for invasion and metastasis is for those connections to break down. So I once illustrated this with Corolla Stoltz by doing a little dance together and then working off and free <laughs> uh, So that's the idea. So these are uh, molecules and genes associated with that stage in cancer progression and ovarian cancer. So a subset of a subset of a cause, of a set of causes associated with a subset of a subset of um, cancer is associated with one particular stage of one particular cancer. Now multiply that by the thousands and you get a sense of the complexity of the many, many, many different kinds of cancers and their causes. And then you think, how could we ever come up with a general model of cancer progression or causation? And why would anyone ever think that's a reasonable goal to have? People have tried to do it. And in fact, I'm going to argue that at least one model, which turns out to be very general and not very predictive, is probably a true model, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so I think this raises some really interesting questions about perspectivism, and pluralism, and realism. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you a taxonomy of different kinds of formal models of cancer. I do not intend this to be a, um, an exhaustive summary of all the senses in which we talk about models in cancer science. That would take a year. I'm just going to look at some of the models, namely um, some mathematical and computational models, the network models, and, and I'm going to talk more about the strategies of the models than the formalisms, because it turns out the formalisms are kind of irrelevant, and you can, you know, uh, pick and choose and switch out the formalisms in lots of interesting ways. I think the strategies are kind of more interesting and relevant to the realism question. And then I'm going to look at a couple of case studies, and then I'm going to see if in what sense we should be pluralist about modeling in cancer science. And then consider how that's how the to the extent that this mod, these modeling strategies are pluralistic, um, they lead to one endorsing a kind of perspectival realism. And I'm going to give a, a moderate defense and attempt to search for a kind of middle ground between the realist and the, um, the perspectivist. And I also think that Shane's active realism is a nice antidote to um, some kind of dogmatism in this context. So I'm going to sort of sum up with a bit of that. So here's my preliminary taxonomy of formal modeling strategies in cancer science. I think that there are roughly two kinds. There's what's, um, what some, this is actually not, the first distinction is not mine, there's what some have been calling data-driven models. And 
part of the problem with cancer science is that we are data rich and theory poor. So there's enormous amounts of genomic and epigenomic and transcriptomic and proteomic data in these huge databases that people are trying to organize and make sense out of. And so there are lots of pieces of data and people are trying to use various formalisms to organize the data and use it to um, make predictions and drive hypotheses. And so there are lots of different kinds of formalisms that people use to represent that information and to establish correlations and then use that to make predictions, for instance, about the relative aggressiveness of this or that type of cancer, or more generally to try to come up with general theories of patterns of network associations across cancer that tell us, okay, given this kind of network, should we expect this cancer to be more or less evolvable or better able to respond in case of insults like chemotherapy, or should we expect it to be not so evolvable? So those are the kinds of modeling strategies that people use that are largely data-driven. Um, and then, this is actually not my expression, I don't like it very much, but um, some cancer scientists use it. There's this knowledge base, which is really more based on experimental work, often, um, or epidemiological data, or some, um, yeah, I guess there's problems that overlap. But so <laughs> then there are like very simple algebraic and kinetic models that try to represent particular mechanisms associated with particular types or subtypes of cancer. Um, there are agent-based models that look at individual cancer cells um, and try to understand the dynamics of population change in cancer cells and using the, these kinds of agent-based approaches. The land models, there are multi-scale models. I'm not going to have time to talk about all the different types, but I will talk a little bit about multi-scale models in cancer research and why I think there is some interesting but different questions. Um, so I think that there are roughly two sort of classes of goals that these modeling strategies have. I mean, a lot of them are frankly just pragmatic and instrumental because, of course, why do we want to model cancer? Because we want to figure out how to intervene on it, either to prevent it or um, to treat it. Um, so a lot of what's going on in this cancer modeling work is simply um, generating predictions about how to classify and treat and give prognoses of different types of cancer. But sometimes also they're looking at looking for common causes and structures that you can see across these different cancers. So it comes closer to the sort of philosophical imagination of what theories should do um, in that they're trying to come up with some, some universal like theory-like things, um, but largely this is in service of figuring out how we can intervene on particular causal pathways. So you might say, okay, this particular um, structure um, can be intervened on successfully with this class of drugs. Um, and so you might want to know whether you can find that structure across a variety of different cancer types. But then there are more uh, theoretical models, which are often more general, or in service of um, generating sort of high-level um, hypotheses um, about things like robustness, like I mentioned before. Um, and sometimes they're just sort of armchair models where you build a computer simulation and you imagine well, what would be the case if um, tumors had this physical particular shape versus that shape and they inter and inter interacted with some sort of blood supply in this way, how would that go, right? Um, and oftentimes these aren't even based on very clear data. It's often just like, well, let's, let's, we're engineers or we're physicists and this new push towards more integrative biology has been drawing in these people from other disciplines who know nothing about biology but are really good at building computer simulations. And they will do these kinds of things and then figure out, oh, we have a prediction about this structure having this particular outcome. <coughs> okay, um, but I think some of the same old questions that Levins um, pointed to in the 1960s about modeling regarding trade-offs arise also in the context of cancer research. So there are a lot of problems with trade-offs between having a general model and a precise model or a realistic model. Sometimes you can have a precise and realistic model that's not general. You can have a general precise model, but it's not very realistic. <laughs> right, so a lot of these trade-offs come out in the context of cancer modeling. And so I think that you can think of these models along different dimensions. And I haven't worked out entirely how to model these dimensions and how they get traded off with one another. So I think it's a very good question. In fact, Carl Craver was like, why don't you build the whole multi-dimensional space? <laughs> I was like, okay, not enough time for the talk. But at some point, I will build a multi-dimensional space that maybe shows how these things trade off. But I think that it's an interesting question is how they trade off and why they trade off the way they do. All right, I'm gonna give you some more examples 
um, because I think that they help raise some of the philosophical questions people have been talking about here. So, um, and also because um, I love talking about cancer and uh, I pretend like I know something. <laughs> All right, so here's the simplest model. Um, it's right here at the top. This comes from, um, it goes back to the 1920s. Armitage and Dahl, Lucy Clausen, a number of different epidemiologists and theorists started thinking about the fact that, well, we know that cancer incidence it roughly increases as the power of age. Aha, we can build a very simple model to represent that. What if cancer was the product of a series of rate limited changes that in, over time accumulate um, that yield a sort of shape, a logistic sort of shape of curve of cancer incidence? That would give us the observation we have in the way that cancer incidence is a power increases the power of age. And no surprise, surprise, going back even to the 19th century, we knew that chromosomes in cancer cells were bizarre and strange, and they didn't look like chromosomes in other cells. So maybe um, these rate-limited changes could be traced to something like chromosomal changes or mutations. And this was the beginning of, um, and became into this sort of modeling strategy was the beginning of, and became integrated into the multi-stage theory of cancer. And I'm going to talk about that as the one, if you like, as, as good as we can get unifying theory of cancer. Cancer modeling today doesn't look very much like that. <laughs> um, so this is an example from a, a paper by Chakravar and Tia Sal in 2011. It's a multi-scale model of cancer. And this is an instance of an individual-based model. And why I think it's a useful example for thinking about realism is this is really attempting to model a particular um, process within a particular cancer subtype at a variety of different scales. So it's really trying to be a comprehensive, realistic model um, for some particular outcome. And this is the diffusion of a particular molecule, VEGF, that's associated with growth, increased rates of growth. And what they're doing is they're looking at how the diffusion of that is affected by the particular network properties of um, interactions among genes and proteins within these different types of cells. So the different colors represent the different network profiles of those cells, and that what they're trying to do is, if we know that this network structure is associated with this kind of response to the distribution of the molecule, how would the population change over time versus that structure? <laughs> so here we're talking about multiple different scales and a great deal more detail <laughs> and realism than the kind of general model we're talking about here. And I think this nicely illustrates perhaps along one important dimension the kinds of trade-offs that are involved in modeling cancer. The one man is doing a very particular process and a very particular cancer type, and another, though it's still very general, and another we're trying to generalize across all different kinds of cancers. There's a third category that I think has even wider ambitions, um, and it's also scarily ambitious, frankly, because I'm not sure um, how much sense it's going to make that case. But the idea is, not only are we going to have multi-scale, detailed, realistic models, but we can also arrive at general theories that are themselves multi-scale. And this is the project of some versions, and I, systems biology of cancer is a very diffuse category. There are lots of different people who call themselves systems biologists of cancer. But theoretical systems biology of cancer tries to come up with general theoretical models about network structures across all different cancer types and subtypes that help us predict generally how these network structures yield certain kinds of outcomes. And some versions of these network theories aspire to replace the good old-fashioned multi-stage theory. They think the multi-stage theory is dead, that the picture of cancer that sees it as a product of a rate-limited accumulation of changes to genes. So you can actually black box genes. It could just be epigenetic changes or other kinds of changes. Um, it should be discounted, removed, uh, thrown out, and we should replace it with something that looks a little bit more like this. It's more multiscalar and takes into account the network structure of either regulatory signaling uh, features, whether that includes genes or epigenetics or all various other so that's a little bit more ambitious. OK. So the puzzle, looking at all these very different kinds of models in cancer research with these very different trade-offs and different goals, does that lead us to perspectival realism? And then how does perspectival realism depart in meaningful ways from other kinds of realism, say structural or positional realism? 
Can the history of cancer research or research traditions help us illuminate or adjudicate these debates? Do the use of models and modeling um, um, in these different traditions support um, a kind of perspective? <laughs> and so I'm trying to occupy the little brand. My answer is yes and no. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'm going to elaborate as we go on. But I think one of the challenges is getting to clear on what exactly the target is. And it seems like different perspectives are endorsing different views. So I think, as already has been mentioned, Fury takes a, a slightly more extreme view than people like Frosin, though they're both inspired similarly by the problems of measurement and, and observation. So Fury wants to say that in creating theories, scientists create perspectives within which to conceive of aspects of the world. And these theories are different perspectives. They aren't, um, you know, he says, like people have mentioned before, that there is a world out there, right? Um, but whether the world um, is uh, grasped in the same way across these different theories is not entirely clear. Whereas von Frossen, at least here, seems to be saying general scientific theories in their official formulation are not perspective descriptions. So here he seems to want to say something like that they're, they're getting, they're, they at least attempt to get at um, the general way the world is. So I think initially you might sort of think, well, where's the controversy here? Because everyone grants, as people have mentioned already, that the, the output of a scientific observation reflects the nature of the instruments that have produced, that have produced it and its interaction with selective, selective input, right? Um, so there is, there is a factual matter about the world, but it's, you know, it seems like everyone's willing to grant that we, um, to some extent, are um, getting at those facts in different ways across different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and I think that what um, Massimi has tried to do is, is defend this interesting and useful middle ground where, we, where what we do is we adopt an epistemic perspectivism with respect to gaining knowledge of nature. So our knowledge claims are perspectival, right? Um, but um, these states of the world are perspective independent, um, whereas our, our, our knowledge claims are perspective dependent. So part of my goal in this talk is to try to make sense out of that claim. I think it's an interesting, interesting claim, and I'm, I'm going to try to see how I can use, apply it in the context of cancer research. Um, as as um, he points out, the challenge here, though, is, is saying, what is it like to be true within a perspective, <laughs> right? Um, and she offers an account, I take it, that's um, contextualist and coherentist. Um, Right, that there, that we don't deny there's a causal property in nature, but what justifies it from the perspective. <coughs> so here's a preview of where I'm going to go. It seems like, on the one hand, um, I, should, I should say, philosophical debates about perspectivism and other forms of realism do not immediately coincide with typical ways of talking about modeling most parts of cancer science. So what I'm going to ultimately say is it seems like the right attitude to take with a lot of the modeling strategies in cancer science is a purely instrumentalist one. They aren't necessarily trying to get at the truth, not even part of the truth. <laughs> um, some of these are just simple um, attempts to make predictive models and they do not necessarily get things right or even close to right. Um, but it's true that assessment of models is this highly context, context sensitive matter with aims vary. So that sort of epistemic component of perspective but most such models are not conceived of as rivals, at least in, in the scientific um, uh, in scientific practice. Um, they're mostly useful um, instrumentally, and most formal models of cancer initiation and progression don't serve the purpose of representation in the sense of theories, that the way that philosophers think of theories, right? The aim of theories is to get out the truth. Oftentimes they're data fitting, um, but some do. And I think that the multi-stage theory is one good candidate. And I think a case can be made that to the extent that multiple different independent line, lines of evidence seem to converge in this case, we can speak of this as um, getting at the truth about cancer progression. Though it turns out that it's not a very interesting or predictive truth, <laughs> it's a more general truth. Okay, so here are my examples, and they're talking about multi-stage theory in particular and its history, and then look at some examples also of particular models that are much more instrumentalist in flavor. Okay, um, 
I'm also going to talk about research traditions. So I think that when you go to, say, sit in a class, for instance, at a medical school and sell molecular biology of cancer, at the end of the class, the professor will stand up and say something like, cancer is a genetic disease. Everyone knows what that means, right? And all the medical students will nod their heads and then they'll move on. <laughs> right? And I think what the right way to interpret claims like that is, that is one research tradition within cancer research that has been enormously fruitful and has helped us discover facts about cancer, properties of cancers across different contexts. And so when you say cancer is, for instance, a genomic or genetic disease, what you're interested in is the genetic causes, and you can latch on to them. It's a fruitful research program. Um, likewise, with respect to all these other different perspectives on cancer, taking cancer to be a disease of the tissue microenvironment has been enormously fruitful. Taking disease, cancer to be a disease of aging has been enormously fruitful. Taking it to be a metabolic disease also has been enormously fruitful. Each of these research programs has latched on to particular causes of cancer, in part because, of course, cancer is um, massively heterogeneous, and there are, a lot, there are at least one-fifth of cancers are infectiously caused, at least remotely. Um, so yes, I mean, all of these are true. We don't have to choose between them. Um, so I think that if, if your concern about cancer um, is about these, re these variety of different perspectives in this sense, um, it's, a, it's a false contrast to try to look for um, uh, one causal story. And I think that's going to emerge as I talk a bit about the multi stage theory. You can look at the history of cancer research as an attempt, and Siddhartha Mukherjee makes a really nice case for this in his book, to latch on to one silver bullet. Right? The hope is, well, maybe if we just knew what that cause is that genuinely caused cancer, we could intervene there, whether with respect to genes or environmental factors or viral factors. A lot of the history of cancer research has been looking for that um, bullet. And oftentimes, and this, is, this attempt at discreteness is, to the historians in the room, I, I sincerely apologize, because of course everyone knows that these research traditions are intertwining and mutually informative and that they're not discrete at all. And part of the reason I put cellular chromosomal first is because we go from bovary and talking about inflammation and then we talk about environmental causes and it's just more of a matter of emphasis and the number of people working on it and the kinds of people working on it. It's nothing like these discrete um, patterns that we see. But one pattern I think that has woven through all of these is the multi-stage theory. Um, and it helps make sense of a lot of the observations we come, that come from epidemiological research as well as the cell and molecular biological research. So here's one of the major pieces of evidence. This comes from a paper by um, Knudsen, which was published in the 1970s. Knudsen studied childhood retinoblastoma. And what he did was he found that there were different kinds of retinoblastoma una, um, in one eye versus two eyes. And he found that the unilateral cases generally, by and large, occur um, much earlier, no, later, sorry, than the bilateral cases. And his thought was, well, what would explain this? What would explain this is if cancer is due to a number of hits to genes that you either get inherited or are acquired. So this tied nicely with the observation that I mentioned earlier by Armitage and Dahl and um, among others, Lewis and Clausen, that cancer might be a rate-limited multi-stage process. And what explains the differences between inherited forms of cancer, which by and large occur much earlier in, in life, and somatic cancers, which are the vast majority, um, has to do with the, the as it were, the, the rate of onset being accelerated by the acquisition of mutations earlier in development, namely in this case, all the way back from the So this is the two hit theory. And it turns out that um, he made this prediction that there might be a particular gene associated with this particular cancer, and lo and behold, in the 1980s and 90s, um, the oncogene paradigm took hold. A lot of researchers focused their attention on trying to find particular genes associated with particular cancer types and subtypes, and this was one of the first they found. And it nicely fits with the prediction and the theory, the mathematical theory that we had earlier up there, namely that um, yeah, after a number of things, we can get a quite early stage um, disease, in this case, childhood retinoblastoma. And I'm not going to go into the, like, some of the details here. Um, so over the course of the history of mathematical modeling of cancer, what you see is all these new pieces of data being integrated into and, and, develop, and people developing more complex models, models that are more case-specific for particular types and um, subtypes. 
But I think, frankly, I'm going to focus here on the Armitage and Dahl and the Commitments to Hit hypothesis and talk about that. So in this case, what we find is there's this very simple model. Incidence is related to time and rate of onset of mutations. And you can predict the number of core events necessary for different cancer types and subtypes based on that model. So for instance, at least prostate and breast cancer turn out to be more complicated for lots of reasons. But a lot of these cancers, what you can do is you can take the slope of the curve of incidence and use that to extrapolate back the number of, as it were, major mutations of importance to that particular type and subtype. And the most famous and successful example, the most predictive case, is colorectal cancer. You can actually document the specific number of mutations associated with this particular disease. So you take the acceleration curve, right, and that gives you, for instance, um, the derivative, the slope, of, gives us the age-specific incidence plot, and then you can extrapolate back to the number of events necessary to get that curve. Now, of course, with every general law, there are exceptions. <laughs> so in biology, everybody knows things go wrong in lots of different ways. Um, and there are lots of instances of cancer that look a lot different from this. Um, so there's punctuated cases where you get major chromosomal events that mess everything up and cause, um, cause cancer to accelerate much faster. But the vast majority of cancers um, occur at later ages and many of them do seem to follow this per pot pattern and are associated with, roughly, amazingly enough, some major mutations on the range of you know, five to six to seven. And you can also use this curve to predict and explain the difference between incidence of, um, of sporadic and inherited forms of the same cancer. So for instance, um, uh, familial adenomas polyposis, familial, all right, I'm gonna mess this up. <laughs> People who get polyps early in life tend to get um, this cancer and they inherit a particular mutation and it turns out the curve of acceleration for those individuals looks quite similar to the average curve of the incidence of, of colorectal cancer in the lifetime of, a, of, um, of the individual of, of the population. And so you can actually use that to predict how the acceleration curve changes and what goes through blood and blood. And this was 30 years before there were any genes discovered that are associated with those particular patterns. Okay. So the variety of different independent sources of evidence that support the multi-stage theory, from epidemiological evidence to looking at particular chromosomal abnormalities and genes, to even, I think, evolutionary considerations led support to this idea. Um, whatever mechanisms ensure cellular cooperation are things that have to be inherited more or less. And I think it's a really example, a really good example of what Wimsatt has called um, reductive heuristics. Um, so descriptive localization, identification anchoring, we're looking at particular kinds of causes and their, um, and their role in particular um, outcomes. And it's descended, a lot of these models are descended from very simple models in evolutionary genetics. And you can use some of the same modeling strategies to predict and explain patterns of incidence. Okay, now I've told you this great, great, magnificent story of how multi-stage theory got everything right and it's converged on the truth, but, ah, okay, <laughs> these two guys say no. <laughs> so in 1999 and ever since, with a highly regular basis, these two individuals have published articles claiming that the multi-stage theory is a failed theory, that it's unsustainable, that it should be replaced with the tissue organization field theory, it's reductionist, determinist, and just plain wrong. Um, so what should we do with these claims, right? As a philosopher, right, so you might say, oh, these are marginal figures, they don't really aren't, you know, the vast majority of cancer researchers accept multi-stage theory. Um, and I think the right thing to say is they're right and the multi-stage theory is right. <laughs> the multi-stage theory does capture some aspect of the vast majority of cancer causes, namely that there is some rate limited process that explains the vast majority of cancers, which a lot of arise late in life due to the accumulation of a series of events, rate limited events. Are they all mutations? No, there are lots of different causes um, from the molecular on up. 
that are that generally are associated with the development of cancer. Um, but so is it true that the tissue microenvironment plays a role in cancer? They're both latching on to causal explanations. So I think the right thing to say is, um, with respect to the vast majority of cancer modeling, most of these models are problem-based. They're answering specific kinds of questions, they have specific targets, they make a number of idealizations and abstractions, um, and there are lots of examples. I, I'm wondering how I'm doing on time. Doing well. Okay. Yeah, doing fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, how many minutes? Ten. Okay, ten minutes. All right. So this is just one example. This is a highly idealized model that tells us for ten tumors of a certain size, with a certain number of, um, uh, with a certain rate of mutation, with a certain death rate, you predict how many drugs you should give them to prevent chemotherapy and how responsive they will be to this or that drug. So the punchline is. Bigger cancers with higher mutation rates and higher death rates give more variability of drugs because it will involve responsiveness to a, a majority or greater number of drugs than faster than smaller cancers with short with um, less high rates of death rate, less death rate, slower death rates, and um, lower mutation rates. Um, and is, are those realistic models? Well, no. I mean, they don't capture all the causal pathways of relevance to the acquisition of chemotherapy resistance. Um, but um, they capture some, right? And, and ultimately, what that model does is it helps us make predictions and discover new things. Um, and some models are more subtle and theoretical. They aim for these kinds of general and variant relationships like the multi-stage theory. Um, but the problem with general models is that they're not very interesting, and um, this is one. So this is the no duh model, though it got like more press from the New York Times than almost any other cancer publication in the past five years because it contains the word luck in the title. So they said, this is, cancer is a, a matter of luck. Well, what they really meant was, um, all right, cancers arise more frequently in tissues with higher rates of stem cell turnover. So stem cells are the cells that, so the most obvious example is in the colon, that sort of live at the bottom of these little um, crypts, called colon crypts. And they, um, they, they divide, are constantly dividing, and they yield the downstream cells, the, um, the cells that develop into the sort of the, the happy things in the colon that pass things along, right? Um, <laughs> for other, other word. Um, and the idea is, if you have a higher rate of stem cell turnover, you're going to acquire more, acquire more mutations that yield um, um, uh, tumors than if you have a slower rate of stem cell turnover. And what they showed is, well, it turns out that the tissues with a higher rate of stem cell turnover do, in fact, have higher rates of cancer. Um, and so this is a very simple, true, general, predictive model, but it's, but it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't do much more than, than summarize the truth. I mean, you can put this in a mathematical equation that, if you like, but it's not very um, useful. So the terms of general models, I think, um, aren't very interesting. Um, and I think this, the teller sort of made this point nicely. Even supposing wonderfully simple universal laws, including a complete description of all the forces and dynamics, such laws would not by themselves provide a theory we could much use for the initial condition. Well, actually, this is a different point. Initial conditions are far too messy. So um, I think that this applies to many of the multi-scale models. Um, and what cancer scientists are doing when they're trying to build these multi-scale models is what Levin's called, I think, a naive brute force approach, including all the relevant variables at all the different scales. Part of the problem, and I think this is just another side of the trade-off, is that these kinds of models are require so much information that they tend to be very narrow and very specific and if not be it help us predict across a variety of different contexts how cancers are likely to behave. So like I mentioned at the beginning, there are a variety of these multi-scale modeling projects attempting to integrate data from the atomic on up to the macroscopic. Um, and what they do is they start with some experimental work, they build various wiring diagrams and network models, they develop formal equations, and they might try to come up with generalizations about attractor states like the kind of systems theoretic approach that I mentioned in the beginning. But there are real challenges in these models, namely data sharing. Um, the data in a lot of these um, databases is not, shared, is not 
coded the same way, um, estimating all the initial parameters, the computational demand, like I mentioned, the heterogeneity of cancers, um, coming up with these network principles, it turns out it's much more difficult than um, a lot of systems theoretic biologists thought at the beginning. Um, and oftentimes, the best that we have is a lot of um, patterns of association without much knowledge of how the causes are realized by these patterns. So I think you can say, well, theoretical models are very boring, but the, the, the kinds of models that attempt to do everything are enormously difficult to produce, and oftentimes are based on a best correlational data and not necessarily very good functional understanding. So this leads me to this question, well, why would we want integration in the first place? If it's so hard with respect to particular multi-scale models, and, it's so, and it gives us such boring answers at the general level, why is integration a goal anyway? Um, and I think that that's a question we should be asking ourselves. I think philosophers have tended to assume, we want unified theories. <laughs> but it turns out that, that eh, I don't know. So it seems like integration can be fruitful. I think the multi-stage multi theory was fruitful, but not because it got things right, necessarily. It, it was fruitful because it helped found a research program that itself has been fruitful and has helped us grab onto various causal facts about cancer. Um, we have to have good reason to think that a particular mix of perspectives will be of And it's not always the case that getting all the causal dynamics and causal pathways right is useful. Um, it depends on what we want our integrations for. Okay, so I think that the right thing to say is, if you look at all these models of cancer, there are some cases where models are resilient or make robust predictions and give unified theories. Um, and I think that some sort of dispositional or structural realism makes sense out of these modeling practices. But I also think that questions about justification seem misplaced in many of these cases. Since the generality often comes at the cost of real predictive explanatory power. So these models might be better viewed as successful in the sense of successfully founding research problem, projects that help us get at truths rather than stating general true laws. And I think that um, other models are, are designed to solve specific problems and are much more pragmatic. And the question of truth there is often always very relative to And I like um, Chang's active realism as a sort of way of resisting the leap of faith that seems to come with a lot of the um, uh, traditional realist approaches. So I think that this can be an antidote to a certain kind of dogmatism about theories. So for instance, one way of, of seeing the history of cancer research is we got everything right. Um, we, we arrived at the multi-stage theory, there are multiple independent lines of, left, of evidence that cancer is a genetic disease. Everyone knows that, what that means, right? And we all shake our heads and go to our medical boards and pass. But I think the right thing to say is, this has been a successful research program. It, it's helped us identify various important factors in maybe a vast majority of cancers. But there are other options, and we should pursue them. And we shouldn't give up on the possibility that we come, could have come up with a general theory of cancer that's based on features of the tissue microenvironment or angiogenesis. And why not, we, why not go and pursue that too? Um, so as a research program, I think the multi-stage theory has been successful. And I think we, get, we run the risk of getting stuck in a theoretical framework um, when reasonable alternatives are possible if we take a realist stance towards the practice of science. That's the wrong stance to take. And maybe what we should do is take a much more pluralist stance towards the practice of science. So thank you very much for your attention.